Listo. Pues nada, Mauricio, son todos tuyos. Este, son chicos de los últimos semestres y de que están iniciando su posgrado. Adelante. Muy bien. Uh, ojalá no haya problemas si, si la hago en, en inglés, porque los términos me los sé bien en inglés y en castellano los tengo medio... No, no, adelante. Medio ok. Gracias. Entonces déjame compartir mi pantalla antes de cambiar. Ok. All right, I'm going to switch, switch to English now. And um, thank you so very much for the invitation. I'm so happy to talk to you. It's been a while since I've been in Mexico, but I remember my time there fondly. And today, what I'm going to do is the first of two parts uh, that serve as an introduction to high energy cosmic neutrinos. And what I'll try to do is not give you details, but rather give you the overview of the field, especially what's going on now, what have we, what have we found so far after a few years of uh, detecting high energy neutrinos and uh, what we want for the future for the next 10 to 20 years. So let me start with basic stuff and I will slowly build up to newer stuff and uh, I'll continue tomorrow where we stop. All right, so neutrinos, as you know, are elementary particles. Uh, they're electrical neutral. They are very light, uh, so light that we don't know how light they are and they are superbly antisocial. So if you want to place them in a plot of uh, interactivity, let's put it in the y-axis and mass in the x-axis, neutrinos are in the lower left corner. So they are very light. Uh, as I said, so light that we don't know how light they are. And they are very weakly interacting. In fact, they only interact by the weak interaction. And of course, like all particles, they become more strong interacting at higher energies. And that's going to become important a bit later because we're going to be talking about high energy neutrinos. But not only that, uh, neutrinos are uh, ubiquitous. They come from uh, everywhere and uh, all the time. They come from nuclear reactors, they come from the sun. They come from uh, the decay of radioactive elements in the Earth's crust, from particle accelerators, from supernova remnants, from very far away sources at the edge of the universe, and across a very uh, wide range of energies and distances. Um, so if we want to plot their fluxes, uh, what you see, first of all, is that the energy that the neutrinos have spans many orders of magnitude, more than 20 orders of magnitude in the, the x-axis. And uh, the, the fluxes also expand several orders of magnitude in the y-axis. So towards the left, um, we have what we call relic neutrinos, which are like the cosmic microwave background, but the neutrino equivalent, they're very low energy. They should be abundant, but we have not detected them yet because their energies are very low. Uh, towards the MEV, KEV range, we have well-known neutrino fluxes, the solar neutrino fluxes, and there is several yellow lines there corresponding to the different neutrinos from the different parts of the uh, fusion chain. Uh, at least one instance of neutrinos from a core collapse supernova, and we expect there to be many more. We're looking for those. And uh, towards higher energies and then to the 9 EV uh, or so, we see atmospheric neutrinos, which are created when charged particles from outside the atmosphere called cosmic rays interact with the atmosphere and make particle showers. And uh, these are abundant and detected. And at even higher energies between 10 to the 12 electron volts and uh, let's say 10 to the 15 electron volts, which we call TeV to TeV, those are what we call today high energy astrophysical neutrinos. And they are fairly new. We have known them for less than 10 years at this point. And now we detect them regularly, but there's a lot of things that we don't know about them. I'm gonna say a few things about that later. And in the next decade, we expect to find even higher energy sources, uh, uh, sorry, higher energy neutrinos that have been predicted for about 50 years at this point, but have not been detected yet. So that's the next step in, in, in the story. Uh, and we're gonna center the discussion in these two, the TEV to PV neutrinos, which we have seen, and the PV to EV neutrinos that we have not seen yet. Um, so as I said, neutrinos come from a variety of sources and, and you can arrange those sources according to the neutrino energy, again, in the x-axis and the distance that the neutrino travels from the source to the detector. And you see that towards the bottom left corner, we have all the usual suspects that have been studied for, for many years, the reactor neutrinos, uh, geoneutrinos, solar neutrinos, uh, a bit higher energy atmospheric neutrinos, long baseline, short baseline, very short baseline, and at higher energies, supernova. But on the opposite end, we have high energy neutrinos, which are the TeV, PV neutrinos I've talked about, and even higher energy neutrinos, which we have not detected yet, which we call ultra high energy neutrinos. So 
Those are the highest energy neutrinos we have seen so far, and they travel the longest distances, essentially the size of the observable universe, a few gigaparsecs. So what can you do with these? Uh, on, you can do things, both raster physics and particle physics. The fact that these have the highest energies uh, for any neutrino that we expect means that we're probing the most violent acceleration processes in the universe that can make particles at the absolute high end of the particle spectrum. And we don't know what they are yet, but neutrinos are helping to find that out. And for particle physics, what it means is that you can probe particle physics uh, or fundamental physics, I should say, at energy scales that would otherwise be unreachable. So this is uh, far beyond the reach of any uh, man-made particle accelerator. And the fact that they travel the longest distances for astrophysics means that we are probing very far away sources, as I said, gigaparsecs uh, away from us. Uh, towards the edge of what is the observable universe. And for us, for fundamental physics, what it means is that along this very uh, uh, long distance travel, uh, even tiny new physics effects can accumulate and become observable by the time that the neutrinos reach Earth. So they allow us to test fundamental physics, even if individually the effects are very small. Um, but not only that, uh, that's from the theory point of view, that's what makes them interesting. But from the experimental point of view, there is a very rich experimental landscape uh, already existing today. Uh, that's becoming uh, even richer in the next 10 to 20 years. What you see there overlaid on top of the different neutrino sources are the existing and planned experiments that target different kinds of neutrinos. So you see some towards the lower energy, Juno, Super K, Adobe with Gadolinium, Hyper K, which is the, 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 the next generation of Super K, Dune, Towards high energies, we see Ice Cube, which exists already, Chem3Net, Baikal, and even high energies uh, have, are being targeted by a variety of different detectors with different techniques. So there's a lot of promise for the next decade or so, which then uh, makes, us, makes, makes us excited for what we can do today planning for the future. So in this couple of lectures, what I'll try to do is, um, well, I'll divide it in, in, in two parts, and for today, I'm going to give you an overview of the basics of neutrinos. I'm going to skip a lot of, uh, as I said, of details and focus on what we need to know to understand high energy neutrinos. I'm going to show you what the experimental status is today of those and what we have learned about astrophysics. And, and we'll uh, take over from there tomorrow. So let's start with the basics. Um, so we've known now how the existence of TV to PV astrophysical neutrinos for about eight years. Um, so, so far we have characterized the flux of these neutrinos, and I'll say more about that later. And we started to find some of the astrophysical sources, but it's very difficult. In the next 10 years or so, so in the, in the ongoing decade, we hope to find more astrophysical source candidates and characterize the flux even better. So we're going up in the slope in the mountain. And then in the 2030s, which is currently under planning, we hope to discover neutrinos with a thousand times higher energies. And that's, as I said, the next goal of the field. Now, we don't know, even though we have discovered uh, high energy astrophysical neutrinos, we don't know where they're coming from. We do have good ideas about where they're coming from. And we believe the sources look something like this. Uh, some uh, compact astrophysical source, like a black hole, for instance, that is uh, spewing out jets of relativistically moving matter uh, like the one you see here in an artist's rendition, uh, within the jet, particles are accelerated and interact. And when they interact, some of the secondary particles that they produce at very high energies are neutrinos. So when the jet is pointed at us, we have a chance of looking at this very high energy neutrinos. And I'll say more about the dynamics of, of these potential sources later. But for now, let's think about the toy model of high energy neutrino production. So within these astrophysical sources, specifically within these jets, uh, we have uh, matter, so protons, and the protons are charged. And these jets contain supposedly high enough magnetic fields that they are able to trap the protons uh, while they are relatively low in energy. Uh, so they trap the protons and the protons are crossing uh, some shock wave inside the jet. And every time the, the proton uh, is, is uh, crossing the, the shock front, sorry, uh, it gains a little bit of kick. Um, and, and, and gains a little bit more of energy. So eventually its spectrum looks kind of like an e to the minus two spectrum that's coming from a mechanism called Fermi acceleration. And, and you can uh, look that up. 
And on the other hand, uh, as I said, these are luminous uh, jets as they're producing secondaries and the secondaries include photons, but the photons also uh, behave as target for the accelerated protons. So these very high energy protons can interact with the uh, photon target in the sources and that looks more or less like a power law with a kink usually at a certain energy. And when that happens, uh, about 50% of the time, you create a delta resonance. Delta resonance is a proton with a slightly higher mass, like 1.2 uh, MeV. Um, the proton, uh, sorry, the delta resonance is very short lived and it decays quickly into either a proton or a, and a charge, uh, sorry, an, a proton and a neutral pion or a neutron and a charge pion. And then the neutral pion decays further into two gammas, which contribute to the gamma ray emission from the source. Um, and the uh, pi plus decays into a antimuon plus a new mu. The, the antimuon decays further into uh, a new mu bar, a positron, and a new E. So you end up having for each pi plus decay or for each uh, proton photo interaction, uh, the production of two uh, muon neutrinos and one electron neutrino here. On purpose, I'm not distinguishing between new and new bar. The reason is, as we'll see later, detectors don't add these energies. And finally, uh, you see that sometimes the delta resonance decays into a neutron. The neutron has no electric charge, so it's not magnetically confined in the source. It escapes and it beta decays once it has left the source into a proton. And the protons contribute to what we see at Earth as ultra high energy cosmic rays. Uh, and I should say that this is not the only way one can make neutrinos. You can also make neutrinos when the protons accelerated in the jets interact with ambient matter, not just ambient photons, uh, but the decay chain is pretty similar. Um, interesting thing here is that the neutrinos that are generated uh, uh, get a sizable part of the parent proton energy. So we're talking about protons that reach energies of 10 to the 21 electron volts or so. Those are the highest energies that we know exist so far in nature. And the neutrino gets about 5% of the power and proton energy when it's produced. Um, so if you see a neutrino 1 PeV, and we have seen them, it means that they were probably made by protons of 20 PeV or so. Uh, and a gamma rays follow a similar relation with gamma rays coming from the pi zero decays. Um, so there's this toy model of multi-messenger particle production that involves cosmic rays, neutrinos, and photons. Potentially, and this is the simplest explanation, all three kinds of particles are made in the same populational sources by a network of, of, of processes uh, along the lines that I have described so far. Uh, in reality, as we'll say, I will see a bit later, the uh, situation is a bit more nuanced than that. Um, but okay, so this is, this is what uh, we believe the production to look like. So we have the first stage in the, the lifetime of these particles is the emission, and we've talked about this, and the, these particles propagate from very high redshifts, so very long distances away. We're talking about redshifts of one or higher, so distances of gigaparsec scales. Uh, along the way, the, 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 their energy is diluted by the adiabatic expansion of the universe, so the energy that reaches uh, the Earth, the energy with which they reach the Earth, is a factor of one plus z smaller uh, than the energy with which they were produced. And, and Z here is the redshift. So it's a value of, of one or higher. Uh, not only that, uh, these particles are not propagating in, in vacuum, uh, as you've heard. Uh, these particles are propagated in, in cosmic photon backgrounds, in particular, the cosmic microwave background. And that means that, uh, well, first, the protons are deflected by magnetic energies, sorry, by magnetic fields that exist between the sources and, and uh, the Milky Way. Assuming these sources are extragalactic, there's uh, extragalactic magnetic fields of order of possibly nano gauss and galactic magnetic fields in the Milky Way uh, that are a bit uh, higher in the um, a micro gauss range um, that deflect the path of the proton. So they don't, when they arrive at the Earth, they no longer point back to their original source, but they have been scrambled along the way. And not only that, as I said, these protons are traveling through the CMB, and when they do, they lose energy by pair production, uh, but they also produce neutrinos along the way by the same set of processes that they would produce neutrinos inside a source. So uh, what we call this photo production and, and this process over here. And, and you're seeing that you're again producing two mu neutrinos and one electron neutrino. The photons, uh, or the gamma rays, suffer a, a similar fate. 
Uh, they're produced with high energies, let's say PEVs, but they don't reach us with PV energies. Uh, they lose energy again by per production and, and, and inverse Compton uh, processes. And they reach us roughly with GV to TV energies if they come from outside the Milky Way. And finally, the neutrinos are, are in a unique position. Uh, they are not affected by magnetic fields. They don't interact with the CMB. Uh, they are, however, uh, emitted with uh, initial, what we call flavor ratios of flavor composition of two mu neutrinos per each electron neutrino produced and no new tau production is expected at the sources. Um, and that is because to produce new taus, you need a, uh, to produce charm mesons, which are massive and difficult to produce under the conditions existing in the sources. So you don't expect new taus to be produced. You don't expect new E and new mu to be produced. As you might have heard, neutrinos oscillate, so they change flavor along the way. And whereas they produce, they are produced with one to zero flavor composition, they reach Earth with a flavor composition that populates the three flavors. So equal amount of new E, new mu, and new tau should reach the source, the, the Earth. Um, but here is where there are opportunities for new physics, because if we see deviations from this one to one to one expectation, that might be due to neutrino oscillations behaving differently than we thought. All right. The, Unique thing here is that neutrinos do point back to their sources, unlike protons, unlike photons, which lose energy, which get deflected. Neutrinos don't lose energy, don't get deflected. And that's going to be key to finding the sources of the highest energy particles uh, that are the most distant ones uh, from the most distant sources. Um, all right. So one surprising aspect that has become clear in the past few years is that the energy that is available in gamma rays by the time they reach Earth, neutrinos and cosmic rays, it's about the same order of magnitude. So uh, the gamma rays, neutrinos and cosmic rays that we see at Earth, uh, they are about the same flux level. So this is a hint of possible joint production, which uh, is, is related to what I said a few slides ago, that they may, there may be common sources of these three different types of messengers. And there are models that try to build on, on this observation. Um, and, and actually, they are, they are some of the most attractive ones so far. Uh, all right, so let's compare gamma rays, neutrinos, and ultra high energy cosmic rays. And by ultra high energy cosmic rays, I mean cosmic rays of energies roughly above 10 to the 17 electron volts. And neutrinos of roughly uh, TeV, or 10 to the 12 electron volts higher, and gamma rays in the GeV to TeV range. So, Gamma rays and neutrinos point back at sources. Yes, gamma rays don't get much deviated by magnetic fields. Neutrinos don't get deviated by magnetic fields. Cosmic rays do get deviated, so they don't point back. The size of the horizon, and, and this is related to what you, you heard before uh, in, in the talk before, is, is limited for gamma rays and ultra high energy cosmic rays. So very high energy gamma rays and very high energy cosmic rays will not travel uh, without losing energy uh, for more than a certain distance. In the case of gamma rays, uh, at the highest energies, it's no more than 10 megaparsecs. At even lower energies, a PV is no longer than 10 kiloparsecs. In the case of cosmic rays, it, it, the, the highest energy ones will, won't travel for uh, losing energy for more than 100 megaparsecs, whereas neutrinos just free stream through the universe without losing any energy, essentially, uh, which is what I'm saying here. The energy degradation in gamma rays is severe, as I said, they interact with the CMB, same for the cosmic rays. And for neutrinos, it's tiny. It is the result only of the adiabatic expansion of the universe, which is a factor of order one. Um, now, of course, gamma rays are easy to detect. They're char they, I mean, they're, they can uh, be detected with normal detectors. Ultra high energy cosmic rays are charged. They're relatively easy to detect. Neutrinos are hard to detect. Uh, but again, neutrinos are winning on three out of four. So I call that a comparative advantage. Uh, that said, the full picture of the high energy universe will only come when we fully understand all of the messengers uh, together. So let me focus now on, on neutrinos uh, uh, predominantly. And uh, let's, let's have a mental picture of, of how this works. So we have some sources, and we don't know what the nature of the sources are, is, is yet. Uh, but we do know that it need to be a, a very uh, large distance away from us. And I'll say more about this, uh, this assumption later. And, and what the validity is. Um, and they can be either steady state, so they can be continually be emitting neutrinos, or they can be transient, so they can emit only as a burst of neutrinos occasionally. But they are far away. Uh, and we have seen neutrinos uh, in the TeV to PeV range, as I said, coming from proton-photon interactions, presumably, in the sources, um, or proton-proton interactions as well. 
We call these high energy astrophysical neutrinos. They, they come uh, traverse part of the Earth and they're detected at, at, at specialized neutrino telescopes at the Earth. Uh, but there are a couple of other fluxes uh, that have not been seen yet. And the first one is the source of even higher energy neutrinos. So we were talking before about uh, up to PEV neutrino energies. Now we're talking about EEV neutrino energies coming directly from the sources. We have not seen them yet, but they've been predicted for, as I said, a few decades at this point. Um, and not only that, we talked about how cosmic rays, which are also emitted by the sources, can interact with the CMB along the way to Earth by the same kind of photohydronic processes and create neutrinos of energy even higher than the neutrinos made directly at the sources. And we call these cosmogenic neutrinos. Uh, they also have energies a thousand times higher than the energies that we have been talking so far coming from the sources, and we have not seen them yet. So we have three different sort, three different fluxes of neutrinos. Uh, the only one we have seen so far are the TV to PV neutrinos coming from the sources, even though we don't know what the sources are. The ones that we're targeting in the next couple of decades are uh, source neutrinos, but at a thousand times higher energies, and cosmogenic neutrinos, uh, roughly with the same energies that produce along the way by cosmic ray interactions with the CMB. Okay, so uh, now. Uh, this is about what we expect, but now how do we detect neutrinos? And, and they are notoriously uh, finicky to detect. So uh, let's let's build a toy detector here. And we let's assume we have a neutrino source. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's astrophysical or not. It could be a, a nuclear reactor if you want, and a, and a water tank uh, or ice tank or, or something uh, along the way. So just a collection of protons, uh, the, the more the merrier. Uh, so this is a neutrino source that is emitting neutrinos uh, and in principle, neutrinos will hit the water tank and most of them will go through because as I said, neutrinos are superbly antisocial, which in other words means their neutrino proton cross-section is quite low, but occasionally one of them will hit a, neutrino, a proton, sorry. And when that happens at the energy that we're talking about, so at energies above TeV, uh, then that neutrino will hit, let's say, a nucleon, as it should be a capital N, sorry. So it could be a neutron or a proton and break that nucleon up. So at these energies, neutrinos deep in elastic scatter with the quarks and gluons of the proton or the neutron. So they see the quarks and gluons as, as point particles with which to scatter. And the final state products are either a neutrino of the same flavor as the incoming neutrino. So L here is E, mu, or tau, remember, uh, or a charged lepton of the same flavor as the incoming neutrino. And which one of these two is the final state lepton? It depends on whether the interaction was by a neutral current, in which case you get a, a neutrino in the final state, or charged current, in which case you will get a charged lepton. And the nucleon itself is broken up and into, into quarks uh, that quickly hadronize and create final state hadrons. So, you want to build a detector that can detect any Cherenkov flight that comes from the final state charged particles. So these charged leptons and these charged hadrons over here that move at relativistic speeds within the medium. Uh, because when they do, they, uh, as I said, they, they, move, they, they move faster than, than the speed of light in the medium. They can emit Cherenkov radiation that can be detected by uh, photomultipliers or light sensors placed inside the, the detector. So how to detect a very low neutrino flux, like the one we would expect coming from very far away astrophysical sources, where well, you need to think about uh, first, how to detect many of these collisions because you want to maximize the number of detections to claim the discovery with a certain significance. So the number of interacting neutrinos in your detector will be a function of three quantities. And the first one is the chance that one neutrino interacts with one proton. And that is just fixed by nature. That's the neutrino proton cross section. And that's just given by the weak interactions uh, and by our, sorry, by the weak interactions and by our knowledge of how quarks and gluons move around in a nucleon, which are, for those of you that have heard about this, those are encoded in parton distribution functions that are inferred from lepton scattering experiments. Um, the second ingredient is the number of neutrinos that reach the tank. So that's just a, a, a matter of, of how intense the flux is and how close the detector is to the source. Uh, so 
you, if you're lucky and you actually have an intense source and can place your water tank next to it or your detector next to it, then you might get a, a lot of interactions uh, if you wait long enough. Uh, remember the flux of particles goes down as one over L squared. So that's why you want it as close as possible, uh, the, the distance between the source and the detector. In our case, this, the distance to the sources, the physical sources is fixed. They're very far away. So this is something we don't have a, a lot of control on. Um, and finally, the number of uh, target protons in the tank. So you want to build something as big as possible uh, to maximize the number of interactions. And uh, we'll see that the neutrino telescopes that are used to see astrophysical neutrinos are huge. Uh, so they went this route. Uh, not, not only that, but um, you also need to minimize the background of uh, particles that could interact in your detector, but that are not neutrinos. And uh, so whereas if you want to look at photons, you build something atop a mountain to reduce atmospheric uh, 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 blurring. If you're a neutrino astronomer, you actually build something under a mountain to minimize the incidence of atmospheric muons, which are the ones that would mimic a signal like the one that a neutrino would make inside your detector. So uh, atmospheric muons are made when a cosmic ray or, or a extraterrestrial uh, charged particle uh, impinges on the atmosphere and interacts with a proton in the air, creates a particle shower, including pions and neutrons and, and other short-lived particles. But when these decay, you get muons produced in the atmosphere that reach the, the, the ground level and that could enter your detector if it had been placed at, uh, at the ground level. And uh, it would look like a neutrino. So that's why you build your detector underground to stop those muons from getting to the neutrino. Of course, you don't stop all of them, but you reduce their flux uh, sizably. So any signal that you see is more likely to be due to a neutrino than to an atmospheric muon. OK, not only that, uh, but it's important where you place the, your detector in the world. And uh, it's for the following reason. So let's imagine that we place our, our detector in the, in the South Pole. And uh, the, the line, the dotted, the dashed line you see here is the horizon. And that's when the neutrino comes horizontally into your detector. Um, let's think about neutrinos coming from the Northern sky. So those are the ones that have traversed uh, the earth before reaching your detector. So they have gone through the earth uh, and before reaching the detector place at the South Pole. Some of them will be stopped because as I said, neutrinos are interacting feebly with matter, but at high energies, that cross-section actually is, is growing. So the chance of it interacting with a proton inside the earth is non-negligible. And actually some of them are stopped. Others do make it all the way. And the muons that are created in the atmosphere over here by cosmic rays interacting in the atmosphere and the opposite side of the earth, those are definitely stopped somewhere inside the earth and don't contaminate your sample of detections uh, that come from the Northern Hemisphere. So um, they are, uh, however, these, the, the way the sample of neutrinos uh, is built when using neutrinos from the Northern sky uh, is, is such that you are mostly dominated by neutrinos making the atmosphere. So the same processes that create atmospheric muons also make the atmospheric neutrinos. And if you're looking for at astrophysical neutrinos, then that sample will be not very astrophysically clean. It will be dominated by atmospheric neutrinos. Um, but it will not have a lot, a lot of uh, atmospheric muons. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you think about neutrinos now coming from the southern sky into your detector, then you don't have a way to stop the muons, the atmospheric muons. Those will be in your sample of detected of detections. Uh, but you can clean them afterwards, uh, thinking about veto techniques and, and in clever ways. So you can actually make your sample be not contaminated massively by atmospheric muons and make it astrophysically clean. So the first time astrophysical neutrinos of energies of TeV to TeV were detected, uh, it was by actually using neutrinos from the southern sky, even though in principle, these are dominated by the atmospheric background of muons. There are ways to clean it up, clean them up, and and to make it astrophysically uh, rich, and that's how neutrinos were discovered for the first time. Uh, the astrophysical high energy neutrinos were discovered for the first time. Uh, later, they were also discovered using neutrinos coming from the northern hemisphere. Uh, once the statistics was large enough. Okay, 
So uh, what is the current status of, of uh, neutrino telescopes? Uh, the, we have three that are actually running uh, at the moment. Uh, there's Antares in the Mediterranean Sea, there's Baikal in, in Lake Baikal in Russia, and there's IceCube in the South Pole. And IceCube is the only one so far that has seen the, the flux of TV to PV astrophysical neutrinos. And that's because it's the biggest one of the three. Uh, so I'm going to center my discussion mostly on, on IceCube for now, but uh, the principles apply also to Antares and, and to Baikal. Uh, so uh, ice cube looks kind of like this. It's a, a kilometer cube of Antarctic ice buried between uh, a kilometer and a half and two and a half kilometers uh, underground. So the, there's strings uh, that are uh, 86 strings uh, that are a chain of these photomultipliers that you see here that detect the very dim light, Cherenkov light, that comes from the particle showers initiated by neutrino nucleon interactions inside the ice. So these detectors are, of course, in permanent darkness. So occasionally, there will be a dim flash of light coming from a neutrino interaction. That light will uh, propagate through the ice, uh, very clean ice, into the photomultipliers. And that counts as a detection. The, the strings are separated by about 100 meters. And there's about 5,000 in total of these photo, photomultipliers buried in the ice. And it's been running for more than a decade at this point. Um, there's a counting house with all the, the computers at the top. It looks kind of like this. Um, so just to tell you a bit more, it's, uh, it's sensitive to neutrino energies above 10 GeV. But really, what we're interested in is uh, neutrinos of uh, TeV energies and above. These are atmospheric, whereas TeV and above are starting to be astrophysical mainly. So I already said a bit about how ice cubes is uh, the high energy neutrinos. Let me say a bit more about it. And the, the detection occurs by a, an interaction called deep inelastic neutrino nucleon scattering. And that's, as I said, when a neutrino interacts with a neutron or a proton, and it does so with an energy that is sufficient to resolve the partons, the quarks and the gluons, inside the, the neutron and the proton. And it can happen via neutral current interactions, like this one. Uh, and that is when a Z boson is exchanged between the neutrino and the interacting um, uh, quark and charge current uh, interactions when the uh, mediator is a, a W boson instead. So in the first case, the final state is a, a neutrino of the same flavor as the incoming one. In the final final case, it's a charged lepton with the same flavor as the incoming neutrino. Uh, and as I said, ice cube is a detector of light. So you, it, it will be sensitive to the light made by any final state particle that showers and, and, and creates Cherenkov radiation. So to understand this better, you need to uh, know that in each interaction, the final state lepton, either the neutrino or the charged lepton, receives some fraction of the total energy and the rest of the fraction, that, sorry, the rest of the energy of the neutrino, uh, the original neutrino, goes into the final state hadrons. So out of this distribution of energies, and here why you might have seen before, it's called the inelasticity. It's, it's just a, a random number with a distribution. Uh, uh, the, the, the average value is about uh, 0.25, 0 .30, 0 0.30, uh, these energies. But uh, what, what I should say is that uh, out of this distribution of, of uh, the energy of the initial neutrino into the final state products, uh, part of this is going to go into uh, particles that are charged and that therefore make a uh, turn of radiation that is detectable by the photomultipliers. So the final state hadrons, the X over here, appears in both kinds of interactions. These make hadronic showers, which are just particle showers that contain a higher uh, content of, of pions and neutrons. And whereas the final state charged leptons make uh, either an electromagnetic shower, if this is an E, an electron, or uh, a tau, because tau is also decay into electrons, mostly, um, or, or hadrons. Uh, and if it's a muon, it leaves rather not a shower, but a track. And I'm going to show you in a second how that looks. Uh, the final thing I want to say here is that the neutrino that is created in the neutral current case, it just escapes. It doesn't interact anymore. So if you lose that energy, it leaves the detector. So you see here shower and tracks. Um, showers are made mainly by new E's and new taus, and they are sort of spherical uh, in shape. What you see here is the light 
uh, hitting each one of the photomultipliers in the buried strings uh, of Ice Cube. This is a, a real event, if I'm not mistaken. The neutrino interacted somewhere in the center of this blob and created a, a particle shower of about 10 meters or so in size. And the, the, the shower itself that you see here is the, the photons that have uh, propagated outwards for a few hundred meters. And in the process, they have left an imprint uh, in, the, in the photomultipliers. Um, and in the case of uh, tracks, they are made mainly by the charge current interaction of, of mu neutrinos. Again, the neutrino interacted somewhere in the center of the blob. There's still a shower-like uh, feature over here that comes from the shower initiated by the final state hadrons. Remember that the hadrons are, uh, again, the, the, the hadronic shower also exists in this case. But there's a final state muon that is uh, not contained here, but is actually able to leave the interaction region and, and, and the process uh, leave a track of tearing of light over here, which is easily distinguishable from the from the shower uh, uh, region around the interaction vertex. So you call this a track, and it, it can be as large as several kilometers in size. OK, so if there's a rich uh, uh, zoo of different processes that can happen in Ice Cube, depending on the flavor and the type of the interaction. And uh, in all cases, so you will always have a hadronic uh, shower created. Um, and that applies to the neutral current interaction of any flavor of neutrino and to the charge current interaction of any flavor of neutrino. Uh, but then it, what comes on top of that is different depending on the flavor. So for uh, charge current interactions with electron neutrinos, you get a final state electron, remember? And that electron is quickly interacting with the surroundings and created a, a, another shower, in this case, an electromagnetic shower, on top of the hadronic one. So you see this as a, as a single big one. Uh, the new mu uh, is created uh, when interacts by a charge current interaction, a final state muon, and that's the track that you see here, leaving the interaction region. And the tau is a bit more complicated. Uh, it creates a final state tau. Uh, but the tau decays quickly, and it decays either into an electron plus other stuff, 16% uh, of the time, a muon, 17% uh, of the time, which leaves a track, and then the rest of the time as a hadro uh, into hadrons and create hadronic showers. Um, so these are difficult to distinguish uh, from events created by new E charge current interactions, because most of the time, new tau charge current interactions will give you a shower and only 70 percent of the time it will give you a track which can nevertheless be confused with a track left by new mu so now you understand why distinguishing flavor in ice cube is difficult because many different flavors and um, interaction processes give you the same thing there's one extra process here that is uh, unique to to new tau's in new tau interactions that's called the double pulse and uh, you get two showers cast uh, connected uh, causally uh, and the first shower comes, this one comes from the neutrino interacting with the nucleon. Out comes a tau that propagates for a microscopic distance, hopefully a few tens of meters, or if you're lucky, a few hundred meters. Uh, and the decays hadronically, so in this way, creating a second shower. So if you see these two showers um, connected in time, then it means it was a new tau. And this was predicted, and now it's confirmed. Actually, I'll say more about this later. So. Let me talk about experimental status. And remember, it's been a few years since we discovered astrophysical neutrinos. Uh, we're here, and we're now building more statistics and finding more source candidates. So IceCube has been running for about eight years at this point, at, at least in its full configuration. And it's found uh, a lot many things. It's found uh, about 100 contained events. By contained, I mean events where neutrinos interacted inside the detector. Uh, it can, it, it, it can reproduce, uh, sorry, it can infer the astrophysical neutrino flux uh, with a high significance. It can track back the position in the sky of the neutrinos that it detects, and it can measure the flavor composition. And it does so using the showers and the tracks that we have been talking about as the basis of all this uh, information inferred. And I'll say more about this. But uh, taking a step back, uh, there's four main observables of high-energy neutrinos that IceCube and really any uh, neutrino telescope is sensitive to. And it, it, on, it's on the basis of these that everything else is, is inferred. Uh, the first one is the energy spectrum. 
uh, this is how, how many neutrinos per of, of each energy to detect. And there's standard expectation, which it should be as a, a power law in energy. So e to the minus some number uh, It's the spectral index. So that number that we don't know, and that we only know uncertainly at this point. And this is again, uh, a first order expectation. In reality, it could not, it could be a power law with some features. Uh, the arrival directions uh, of the neutrinos. Uh, so we expect that if neutrinos are made by extragalactic sources that are homogeneously distributed in the sky, then the distribution of incoming directions, incoming directions of the neutrinos should also be uh, isotropic. And uh, that's our standard expectation. We see a deviation from isotropy. It might be telling us something that we didn't expect. Uh, Flavor composition. Uh, uh, remember, I said that we expect equal number of new mu and new tau by the time that the neutrinos reach Earth. If we see a deviation of that, it, again, it can be telling us something we didn't expect. And finally, the arrival times, and that's mainly for transient astrophysical phenomena. So, if you have a burst of neutrinos and gamma rays emitted at the same time, you expect neutrinos and gamma rays to arrive at us also roughly at the same time. If they are very different in the arrival times, it can be telling us something about how neutrinos and photons are produced in different parts of the, of the source or something else. They may be propagated differently. Um, and these are, the, these are the four observables that we will use to define everything else about astrophysics and also about particle physics later. So eight years into, into the business of high energy astrophysical neutrinos, we can make a, a, a couple of tables. The first one is what we know. The second is what we don't know. Um, and there's a third one, which is what we don't know that we don't know. And of course, by definition, we cannot write that. But what we know is, is quite a lot. Uh, there's the distribution of sources of astrophysical neutrinos in the sky is isotropic. Uh, we can fit the energy spectrum of neutrinos with a power law. Uh, at least some sources are, are gamma, ray, gamma ray transient sources as well. And, and I'll say more about this in a bit. There's no correlation yet between the, direct, the incoming directions of cosmic rays and neutrinos, even though they might be made in the same sources. Uh, the flavor composition of neutrinos is compatible with there being an equal number of each flavor. And there is no evidence, at least no uh, salient evidence at this point of new physics. And what we don't know, of course, is what the sources of the, the neutrinos are yet, at least more for most of them. Uh, we don't know exactly how neutrinos are made. We don't know the, the value of these spectral index, but we know it only uncertainly, I should say. Uh, we don't know if there's a, a cutoff in the maximum energy that the neutrinos can make. So maybe there's this suppressed at high energies. It's no longer a power law, but a power law suppressed with an exponential decay. Uh, we don't know if there's galactic uh, Milky Way neutrino sources. So I've been talking about exagalactic sources so far, but there might also be sources inside the Milky Way. We don't know what the precise flavor distribution is. So it is compatible with equal number of each one of the flavors, but uh, it is very difficult to reproduce the, to, sorry, to infer the neutrino flavored composition. So there might be something hiding in there. And we don't know if there's new physics uh, yet, but we have ideas on all of these and there's very fast experimental progress. So uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's promising that we'll actually make progress uh, in, in all of these aspects. So let me now just summarize what we know uh, with the latest ice cube data set, which is 7.5 years of, of data. Uh, there's, a hundred more than a hundred contained events with energy above 60 TeV. What does that mean? As I said, contained events are neutrinos that occurred that interacted inside the one cubic kilometer of ice that makes up ice cube. And you see here a uh, number of neutrinos uh, collected in the uh, number of events, sorry, seen in the y axis as a function of deposited energy. And deposited energy is the energy that is inferred from the light collected by the photomultipliers. And the data is the, the, the black points with the arrow bars. And uh, you see several contributions. You see uh, atmospheric muons in, in, in purple, atmospheric neutrinos in red, and astrophysical neutrinos in yellow. And you see that you need astrophysical neutrinos in order to explain the data. So at this point, the detection of astrophysical neutrinos over the background of atmospheric neutrinos is at uh, more than seven sigma of significance. Um, not only that, you can also see that the neutrinos are attenuated inside the Earth. As, as I said, remember when the neutrinos at, at high energies, their interaction cross section with the protons inside the Earth grows and they might be stopped before reaching the detector. So if you look at the positive values of the cosine of the zenith angle, and, and it doesn't matter really what, what that means, but it means at this point that these are coming from the from above, so from the 
southern hemisphere directly into the south pole, into ice cube, you see that there's no suppression here of astrophysical neutrinos. Just focus on the yellow on the yellow band. So uh, they are not suppressed by interacting in, or, or attenuating uh, inside the Earth. Whereas if you look at the negative values of the of the cosine of the zenith angle, which are the neutrinos that are coming after traversing the Earth, um, then you see a suppression towards large values or very negative values of, of the cosine of the zenith angle, uh, which are the ones that are coming directly from the North Pole and traversing the diameter of the Earth. And you see here that there is a suppression compared to what you would expect coming from the South Pole. And that, that is a result of neutrinos being stopped inside the Earth. Um, so we can take this data and, and fit a, a energy spectrum. And it, it turns out that a good fit is a power law, as we were saying. Uh, looks like this. It's a, the normalization is a free parameter. The spectral index is a free parameter. Uh, conventionally, it is normalized at 100 TeV. And the, for this latest analysis, you should look at the blue curves over here. Um, you see that the preferred value is of the spectral index is about 2.9. That is steeper than we would have expected. Uh, we would have expected something closer to 2 uh, because they should inherit the same kind of spectral index as the protons that gave birth to them. And we expect those protons to have a spectral spectrum like e to the minus 2. Uh, and in fact, when you use a different data set, not the one that was used to make these plots, but one that is um, mainly containing neutrinos from the northern hemisphere, then you actually get a, a spectral index uh, best fit value that is closer to 2. So there's some tension here between the, the, the values obtained for the spectral index using one data set and a different data set. And that's still, it's a, it's a small tension, but it's still being uh, uh, examined. Uh, as I said, you can also do, uh, infer the arrival directions of the neutrinos, and you can place the arrival directions in a sky map. And what you see here is the concentration of neutrinos in the sky in equatorial coordinates. Uh, so what you see here, that's the galactic plane. This, this line and the galactic center is this little point over here. Uh, a proper statistical analysis uh, finds that there is no excess at any point in the sky. So there is no a concentration of neutrinos in any direction at this point in the data. Um, and even if you look at the Milky Way center, the galactic center, there's only a contribution. There's no excess of, of neutrino events coming in any direction. And in fact, if there are any sources, they can contribute only at a few times 10% of the total, the total flux observed. Um, so again, we don't know exactly where most of the neutrinos are coming from. And finally, uh, there's flavor, which is one of the four main observables that we talked about. So let me stop here for a bit and, and explain what I mean by that. Again, we have uh, sources emitting neutrinos. Remember, two thirds of those neutrinos coming from the decay of pions. They are new mu and the remaining third is in mu e. Neutrinos oscillate along the way. They change the number of mu, uh, of mu e, nu mu, and nu tau along the way. And you find that at Earth, you expect equal amount of the three flavors. Uh, so the, the ratio of each flavor uh, of flux to the total flux, we call that the flavor ratios. So instead of talking about absolute numbers, we talk about the relative contribution of each flavor. We call that the F. Um, that's at production time. Uh, they oscillate, and then we can calculate what the expected flavor ratios are at the Earth, because we know how to calculate um, flavor transition probabilities or oscillation probabilities. Um, these depend on mixing parameters, which are measured in oscillation experiments at Earth uh, or using solar neutrinos, uh, or, or, or what I meant is using terrestrial neutrinos or solar neutrinos. Um, and uh, we take that information and the, and the form of this probability to, inf to, to predict what the flavor ratio should be at Earth, given a certain flavor composition at the source. So this would be, these numbers over here would be uh, one, uh, one third for a new E, two thirds for new mu, zero for new tau. And these numbers over here would be one third, one third, one third. Um, Typically, and, and sorry, and this is also where new physics can come in and modify this probability. So we have a handle on new physics by looking for deviations in the flavor composition of the Earth. Um, so typically, we, we show these flavor ratios in, in what we call a ternary plot. You, some of you might be uh, familiar with this. I'm just going to uh, briefly explain how they work. This is uh, this plot assumes unitarity. So 
If you put any point inside the triangle, they have their coordinates have to add up to one. Uh, so each corner means a pure flavor. This is the flavor, uh, this is the pure new flavor. Uh, so one zero zero is the coordinate. This is the pure new mu flavor. So zero one zero is the coordinate, and this is the pure new tau zero zero one. You put a point inside, for instance, this one, you follow the tilt of the tick mark to the flavor that you're interested in reading. In this case, you're interested in reading the fraction of new E that this point represents. You follow this tilt and you find 20%, 0 0.2. You follow the, this tilt to find the fraction of mu mu and it's 60% and the remaining has to be one minus the sum of the other two. So it's 20% of mu tau. And of course you can put it somewhere else like in the center, which is the, the one we'll be talking about. And that means a third uh, of each one of them. So how does this work? Uh, we believe we know how neutrinos are made in the sources. Again, we produce one third of this as nu e, two thirds as nu mu and none as nu tau. We believe we know how oscillations work and these are actually controlled by the by four mixing parameters, the three mixing angles and one CP violation phase. And we know this from oscillation experiments with uncertainties. Uh, and so we want to know what the flavor composition is at the earth. As I said, uh, we know how to calculate this via the oscillation probability. So we take again our one third to third zero, we put it here on the corner where it corresponds. Uh, and we apply the transformation, the flavor oscillation, and that takes us to roughly the center of the triangle to one, one, one at earth. We can start from a different place though. We can start from here, zero, one, zero, and we will end up at a different place at earth after applying the flavor oscillations. The reason why this is interesting is because uh, sometimes when the pions uh, decay, uh, they will decay only after having uh, lost energy by synchrotron uh, radiation. And also the muons that they make will decay only about only after uh, losing energy by synchrotron radiation. That happens when the source itself has a very high magnetic field. So they, they radiate synchrotron uh, by synchrotron before being able to decay. So these two final state neutrinos coming from the muon decay, these are low in energy compared to the neutrino that is coming directly from the pion decay. So these exist, but exist with a low energy and at a high energy, there's only this one, new mu. So we only start with a new mu here. And we call this the muon dam scenario. And finally, you could make neutrinos also by, by neutron decay. So you start in this corner, uh, this is a new E bar only, the beta decay of neutrons and you end up in a different place at earth. Now. This is, of course, if we know exactly how the probabilities uh, work. So we know the mixing parameters exactly, and we can calculate uh, the oscillation probability exactly. Uh, but we don't. We only we know this uncertainly. Uh, and, and, and the data one, two, two, three, and one, three, and the delta CP are known within errors. And, and not only that, the errors are correlated. So we take that into account. Uh, we start again with the, be the, the values of the flavor ratios that Earth can calculated using the best fit mixing parameters of, uh, at, at this time. Uh, but if we allow them to vary the mixing parameters within their uncertainties, then these points become regions and they become bigger, the bigger we allow the, the region in which the mixing parameters can vary. So the regions become, sorry, the points become regions. Um, and that's for the three benchmark scenarios that I've been talking about. But if we want to be completely agnostic, we can say, well, maybe it's a combination of these three, or maybe it's something else altogether. So we should actually account for all possible combinations of new E, new mu, new tau production at the source. Yes, even new tau, uh, and and see what comes out if we also, on top of that, allow the mixing parameters to vary within their uncertainties. If we do that, we apply the same transformation of oscillation probabilities from the sources to us, then we actually end up in a little region, like shaped like a like a bone over here. And that's the region of or the, what we call the theoretically palatable region, or the region where the flavor ratios should lie uh, at Earth if the oscillations behave in the standard way, accounting for our lack of knowledge of the production of neutrinos, which translates into our lack of knowledge in the flavor ratios of production, and accounting for the, the errors in the, in the mixing parameters. So uh, that should be compared to our ability to actually measure flavor, which is uh, exemplified by these, these uh, contours over here, uh, which are the current sensitivity that IceCube can reach to measure neutrino flavors. And you see that they are actually comparable, the size of the sensitivity regions to the size of the expected regions from uh, our models. 
um, that means that it's going to be difficult to distinguish between, for instance, these two possibilities: production by by the this one, the red one, by the full pion decay chain, and the, and the production by the muon dump case. Uh, we don't have the resolution to distinguish between them two now. Uh, so the first limitation is that uh, we have large errors so far, or at least large enough that they confuse these two predictions, uh, these two, uh, the orange and the red one. Uh, however, this will become better by 2030 when other oscillation experiments uh, have uh, pinned down the values of the mixing parameters better. And the second thing is that the measurement of the flavor, the flavor ratios is difficult. That's why these contours are big compared to the size of the expected regions. But this will also get better in a bit more time by 2040 once all the neutrino detectors are or neutrino telescopes turn on. Okay, so uh, I will say one more thing and then I a couple more things and then I'm going to stop. Uh, so so far uh, I've been talking about uh, predictions uh, for the neutrino flavors at Earth, uh, but I'm going to show you why it's difficult to distinguish between them in a little bit more detail. So this is, this is what we saw earlier. And the reason why it's difficult to distinguish between neutrino flavors in, in IceCube is, as I said, many different flavors and, and interaction channels give you the same light, uh, the light profiles as, as, a, as a events. So the new mu's are easy to see because you see a, a track. Uh, and, and then when you see a track, you see, you know that it's most likely a new mu. Uh, but Electron neutrinos interacting by charge square interaction and tau neutrinos interacting by charge square interaction, they give uh, showers in, in, in always for in the case for new E and mostly in the case for new tau. Sometimes the new tau will give you a, a track. So it's difficult to distinguish between new E and new tau. You see a single shower, you don't know if it was made by a new E, it was made by a new tau, it was made by a neutral square interaction of any flavor. So that's where the main ambiguity comes in. Sometimes new taus, however, make tracks. 70% uh, of the time. And, and that breaks this degeneracy between you and your tau softly. So uh, that gives us some kind of handle between new E and your tau. And not only that, this double pulse of World Bang event that we were talking about has now been seen. We have seen the first couple of candidates, uh, the separation between the two banks, the first one from the neutrino scattering, the second one from the tau decay is not too big. It's about 20 meters. It's difficult to resolve. You need to look actually at the, at the uh, photon curves of individual PMTs to distinguish between the two showers. Uh, but it has allowed us to improve the measurement of flavor composition uh, that, that, that IceCube could make. So before the best fit was over here where you had no new tau content according to the data. Now that best fit has moved here to the, the black star, which means that there is new tau content. It's closer to the center where we expect the best fit composition to be. Um, so just to close the idea uh let's just see how this thing will evolve in time the flavor composition uh sensitivity we have today this is what you saw earlier when we calculate the probability of oscillation using the best in balance of the mixing parameters um this was the first measurement of the flavor composition in 2015 this is in 2018 this is the current one these three are based on data you see that they're pretty big uh, the size of these regions. Uh, you see also the best fit values have actually, uh, it, it's gone from one extreme to the other and out to the center. So it's, it's been moving around a lot. Uh, and in the future, uh, including using all available data now, we can actually do a lot better. So the projections show that if we used every bit of data available for to IceCube at the moment, we could actually measure the flavor composition with a lot better, this blue region over here. And in the, if, if we actually, I'll talk about Gen, I skip Gen 2 later, but if we add up on top of that Gen 2, then we can do be even better. And if we use all available neutrinos, we can pinpoint the flavor composition very, very well. Um, let me just close with, with the final thing in the final minute or so. Okay, there's one extra thing that is very new, and that's the observation for the first time of a glacial resonance. So the glacial resonance is, in a way, the last fundamental predicted uh, interaction of the standard model. Let's put it, make it exciting to say that. Uh, it was predicted in 1960 and it's when a new E bar uh, of very high energy interacts with a, an electron, creates an on-shell uh, W boson, which then decays and gives you a, a, a branch uh, into hadrons with a branching ratio of 67%. Um, it can also give you uh, 
decay into a pair of leptons, of course. Uh, this was predicted in 1960, but it was just reported in 2021, so a few, a few months ago. And what you see here is one of these um, events occurred, a new E bar interacting with an electron, not a nucleon, but an electron. And then what is seen here is a representation of the Cherenkov front created by this, this final state muons, sorry, these final state muons that appear over here when the pions decay. So there's a hadron shower created by the decay of the W and then there, that shower contains muons and the muons are moving, um, as I said, faster uh, than the speed of light in the medium and creating a, a front here. And that front has been detected uh, and, and uh, that's the first, we call them, we call them, they, they call them early muons. They are detected before any other bit of the shower. And uh, as a result, this was claimed to be the first observation of a, of a glass shower resonance. Uh, so to, go to, to get it a bit more into detail, uh, the, the reconstructed energy is actually coincident with what we would expect neutrino to be. So 6.3 PeV in order to make a W boson uh, with an with an own mass of W, and uh, you compare that data to the Monte Carlo predictions, it fits very well with we would expect to see if this was a shower coming from the decay of the W into hadrons. So this is, as I said, probably one of the one of the last missing pieces of the standard model, and it, it was nice that it was seen in in ISD. Okay, I'm going to stop here uh, just to give you a teaser. The next bit will be astrophysics uh, and, and and particle physics. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and I'll tell you next time what we have learned about astrophysics. So I'll be happy to take any questions. And while you're thinking about your questions, I'll just show you one thing that might hopefully uh, interest you. And that is uh, if you're like neutrinos, uh, we were organizing a school here at, at uh, Niels Bohr. Uh, it will be online. It starts on Monday. So it, the registration is already way, way past. But uh, I've reopened it today and tomorrow in case any of you want to sign up. And I will be happy to have you over uh, for the week. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Mauricio. So I please uh, ask to the, to the audience to mute your, your microphones and give um, an applause to Mauricio, please. Thank you. Um, there is a couple of questions in the, in the chat. Uh, one is by Karen. I don't know if Karen wants to rephrase it. Uh, sure, yes. I may have a couple of questions. So let's see if I remember correctly what I wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one was just like the definition when you were talking about like the different neutrino fluxes uh, that we were gonna talk about and to talk about uh, cosmogenic neutrinos. I was just wondering if the cosmogenic ones were like, are these like, you know, protons or like Cosmic rays are EV and energy that interact with the CMB and then like produce neutrinos. Is that what the definition yes. was, or did I, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, that's 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 what it is. Uh, let me just go back to that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, to the slide. Okay, so um, right, you're talking about uh, these guys over here. This, these right. are the guys we call cosmogenic neutrinos, and and you're right. Uh, that these are ultraviolet cosmic rays that leave some sources. And mm -hmm. along the way, they interact either with a cosmic microwave background or which are microwave photons or the extragalactic background light, which are UV uh, optical uh, photons. Okay, and, right. uh, in, in, in either case, they give you the neutrinos that they make uh, are, are inheriting 5% or so of the parent energy of the proton. So if you make the calculation, it's, it's, it's at the EV range where you end up with the neutrinos, as opposed to the PEV neutrinos that you make uh, mm -hmm. at the sources typically, those are the ones that I have seen. Uh, yeah, so these, these are the ones that have been targeted together with these ones actually. So I was talking about EV neutrinos for the cosmogenic neutrinos, the ones that are born along the way, but you can also make maybe EV neutrinos inside the sources and that's becoming a, a hot topic in recent years. Right, and how would you distinguish between the two? Like, is it just because they have the same energy but they have different red chips? Uh, well, Let's put it this way. We haven't seen any at EV, right. <laughs> EV energies. Uh, if we see one, then, uh, and, and we don't see it coming from a source, then it's a neutrino that is contributing, an EV neutrino that is contributing to the flux of EV neutrinos, uh, diffuse flux of EV neutrinos. And um, you cannot distinguish between them uh, easily as long right. as you don't see 
uh, one EV neutrino pinpointing at a source, like a right. place. So you will need like a multi messenger confirmation of the source. Uh, most likely. Yeah, yeah, either either you're very lucky and you get the multiplets of neutrinos coming in the same direction, right? Or you get uh, uh, neutrinos at EV energy and photons coming from the same source. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. So there was another question by Pablo Reyes. Yes, thank you very much. Just uh, as a small curiosity, uh, you mentioned that there were some problems about neutrinos that are already known as a form of study or solution and some of them that there was no solution then about them. One of them was the source of um, of galactic galactic sources of neutrinos. What are, what are exactly those, and what is the difference with astrophysical sources? Or am I uh, that okay? That's a, that's a good question. I I skipped through that. I skipped over that. Sorry. Um, so that was my bad. Um, okay. Okay. So let me actually let me say one more thing before before going into that and as a preface. So the first thing I, I'd like to say is that, um, try to find the right slide. Okay, here it is. Um, so th this is what ISCUP has seen as a distribution in the sky of the positions of the neutrinos. And as I said, there's statistically, there's there's no one direction that pops up, uh, pop, pops out as, as being more significant than the others. So that means that the distribution of neutrinos is compatible with the neutrinos being made by an isotropic distribution of sources in the sky. And in turn, that means that these are most likely extragalactic sources because otherwise we would have seen a concentration of neutrinos along the galactic plane or uh, towards the galactic center. Yeah, if these were neutrinos being made by sources inside the Milky Way, because there are more high energy potential neutrino source candidates along the, the galactic plane or towards the galactic center, then we would have seen more neutrinos coming from those directions. We didn't. So, uh, so that's why we believe there to be mo them to be mostly coming from extragalactic sources. Okay, that's the, that's the first thing. The second thing, now to go directly to your question, is that okay. that doesn't mean that there, there are no galactic, or I should say Milky Way neutrino sources. It just means that if there are, they are subdominant or they have not been detected so far, therefore they're may, maybe weak. Uh, so there's a whole host of possibilities and people have tested those possibilities. Uh, you, there, there are some of these here, so that you can have uh, some correlation with uh, unidentified gamma ray sources from catalogs, uh, the Fermi bubbles, the Bernabo remnants, pulsars, microquasars, uh, the, the black hole of the galaxy, the galactic halo, or it could be heavy dark matter decay concentrated to, towards the galactic center. So what you do is you create a mask that is showing where these sources are uh, or where they're more concentrated in the sky. You compare that distribution to the distribution of arrival directions of your neutrinos and you see what the compatibility is statistically between the two, the two maps. And when okay. you do that, it turns out that uh, the contribution of the galactic sources is at most 10% and possibly zero. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Quite anything indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, also, Andrea had a question, but I don't know if it was answered. But uh, Andrea, um, right. Well, it was as uh, Dr. Barranco said already answered in the chat, but um, maybe you could give us uh, further details. I guess uh, my question was about. Uh, I'm sorry, it was in another page, but the the showers uh, in in that. Um, uh, wait a second, please. These, these showers? Yeah. How can we distinguish between the hadronic ones and the electromagnetic ones? I uh, that's a good question. And uh, there's two answers to that. The short answer is we cannot. Uh, and then we live with that. So they are overlaid on top of, of each other. All right. And, and then we see them as a big shower. And, and if there's a uh, the, if there is an uh, electromagnetic shower uh, or, or not, that's a question we cannot answer. Okay, that's the short answer. Um, the long answer is uh, hearkening back to something I said. Uh, 
hadronic showers have a higher content of pions and neutrons than electromagnetic showers, which have a higher content of electrons and photons. So uh, the profile of light emitted in the hadronic shower versus the electromagnetic shower is, is different in time. So here in the hadronic case, you have more muons and more neutrons. Uh, the muons will decay, the muons in the shower will decay after the muon lifetime, which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, a couple of microseconds. I might get this wrong because I haven't done it in a while. Uh, and then you will see a peak in the light uh, profile of this shower at the time that the muons decay and make electrons in their decay. And then you will see a second peak when the neutrons in the shower are captured by surrounding matter a bit later in time. Uh, so if you have resolution in time enough to see these two peaks, we call them the, the muon echo and the neutron echo, you could actually say the shower that I'm seeing is hadronic because you wouldn't expect those peaks to exist if your shower was mostly electromagnetic. Um, so we actually have tested that possibility and it is hard but it is possible and uh, it actually helps a lot so um, what, I, what I was saying now in, in terms of, of, of a picture is this is the light emission from a shower in the, in the y-axis this is the time after the shower starts this is the, the first light you see from the shower at the time the neutrino interacts it creates a particle shower that's the first light the big peak later if you have a hadronic shower you see a the, uh, an extra peak coming from the decay of the muons in the shower and later still uh, an extra peak coming from the neutrons being captured that's what i meant you don't see that peak at least not as intensely if the shower is not a hadronic shower but an electromagnetic one you see this dash line has uh, still has those features but they are suppressed uh, looking for these features in, in in the experiment is hard and and that has to do with the fact of, of the, the photomultipliers are not perfect and sometimes they have noise in this and in, just in this time range, which messes up your, your ability to see this peak. Uh, but in principle, if you had a better photomultiplier and a lot of luck, you could actually see this. All right, I see. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So if there is a couple more for questions, so please unmute your microphone and ask directly. I have another one. Um, mm -hmm. Well, let me think of how to um, put it. Um, cool. If you want to answer, if you want to ask a question in Spanish, it's also okay. Oh, okay. No, it's more of a, I don't know if, whether to call it a political um, yeah, problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um, um, vale, en español. En general, tengo entendido que, pues sí, como físicos no, no solemos recibir un presupuesto como el que quisiéramos, vaya, y más en experimentos de este tipo. Entonces, um, se mencionó durante la presentación que uno de los factores, lógicamente, de, pues por el hecho de que los neutrinos solo interactúan débilmente, eh, necesitas tiempo, necesitas eh, que tu experimento corra por un, un buen periodo de tiempo. ¿Cómo podemos, o cuánto es más o menos el, el tiempo que podemos en cuanto a pues, dinero, economía, y que, que sea rentable, pero que sí, sí te dé resultados que, que puedan decirte algo? Es una, es una buena pregunta y es una pregunta que tiene varios, varias aristas. Entonces, el, 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 cuando conoces una propuesta para financiar un experimento grande, lo que tienes que hacer es asegurar que pase lo que pase, eh, vas a tener resultados que sean útiles para la comunidad. O sea, si, si puedes asegurar que vas a descubrir eh, algo con cierta probabilidad, el, eh, es, es algo atractivo, y si la probabilidad es alta. Pero por supuesto nunca lo puedes asegurar con 100% de probabilidad. Entonces la idea es que las, las agencias de financiamiento eh, financian proyectos uh, poniendo la balanza eh, eh, risk en un lado y, y, y gain en el otro. Y, y es delicado 
cuál es su balance, cuál es, cuál es, eh, el, el, qué, tan, qué tanto pueden, qué tanto están dispuestos a este, desbalanzar su, su balance, o sea, cuánto, cuánto risk están, están dispuestos a, 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 a financiar, a financiar, sí. Y no hay una respuesta única y depende mucho de, si te dicen, estoy construyendo, estoy construyendo un experimento que puede encontrar la solución a qué es materia oscura, eh, pero cuesta 100 millones de dólares, eh, de repente tiene sentido, porque hay un montón de experimentos más pequeños que cuestan menos y que todavía no encuentran respuesta. Pero si tú puedes asegurar que tienes un método nuevo, que, que tiene una gran posibilidad, una gran probabilidad de encontrar la naturaleza de materia oscura, entonces es posible que la agencia de financiamiento lo haga. En el caso de IceCube, IceCube es la segunda generación de telescopios grandes que existen en el, en el Polo Sur. Y, y el, el, la generación anterior, se llamaba Amanda, estaba, eh, ya había llegado a la sensitividad máxima y aparentemente muy cercana para poder descubrir neutrinos astrofísicos. Entonces, construir algo más grande en el mismo sitio con casi la misma tecnología estaba bien eh, justificado porque tenías toda la tecnología desarrollada, tenías la experiencia, tenías logística, eh, y, y parecía que lo único que necesitaba era construir algo más grande. Y por eso es que fue más fácil financiarlo hasta donde, hasta donde yo se fue antes de mi, antes de mi tiempo. Eh, hay, hay, no, no hay una respuesta fácil, el, pero creo que a, a grosso modo lo que va a querer una agencia de financiamiento es poder asegurar que tienes una gran probabilidad de tener resultados útiles para la comunidad. No puedes asegurar nunca que vas a descubrir algo, pero puedes asegurar que vas a cubrir gran parte del parámetro de espacio, por ejemplo. Cosas así. Entonces, este, es, es, un, es un poco de arte, un poco de magia negra y, y, y bastante de suerte. Ok, sí, tiene sentido. De acuerdo. Muchas gracias. Fue una okay. plática muy bonita. Muchas gracias. Muy bien, una última pregunta. Si no, yo voy a aprovechar. Eh, hace años estaba muy de moda un pequeño hueco en el espectro de neutrinos de alta energía, entre 400 y 10 a la, a la 15, creo, ¿no? Este, electron volts. Eh, ¿Qué tan serio es esto? Este, ¿Es simplemente cuestión de tiempo o podemos especular acerca de algo? Eh, es, no es tan serio. Eh, eh, parece, parece que fue una, una fluctuación de eh, números bajos de eventos, porque el hueco se está llenando. Eh, déjame ver si, si, si tengo un espectro aquí donde, donde aparezca. Eh, un segundo. Lo, claro, lo, lo, que, lo que dice Juan es que si sí, había un aparente déficit de eventos entre 400 TV y, y un PV, eh, que la gente estaba atribuyendo como a pertenecer, o como, como evidencia de, de, de algo, de dos poblaciones de neutrinos o, o de algo más, pero, pero eh, también era posible que simplemente era un resultado de estadística baja. Entonces, el hueco que te refieres estaba por aquí. Y hay una especie de déficit, pero es, es completamente compatible a un sigma con, con una explicación normal de neutrinos astrofísicos. Eh, pero antes no había nada. Sí. Claro. Eh, Muy bien. Sí. Bueno, pues muchísimas gracias, Mauricio. Gracias a ti. Este, y de todas formas, nos vemos mañana, misma hora, a las 9 de la mañana, por este mismo canal. ¿Todo?